Ayla, who is in charge of this logistical part, asked me to mention this. So that means that if anyone doesn't want to be recorded, the only thing to do is just switching off your camera, if that is okay for you. So Fano, let's go on with this. Um, yeah, that's the first point. Second point, my name is Jose Brandariz. I'm a senior member of the University of A Coruña's Ecreen Research Group that has been coordinating the organization of this international workshop over the last months. And the word to be used here is coordinated, has coordinated the organization because the real heart and soul of the organization of this international workshop has been Ana Ballesteros, as you all know. So please let me open this international workshop on behalf of this Ukraine research group by essentially saying just two words which are congratulations and thank you. Congratulations for a number of reasons. The first one is congratulations to us all. And that's a very important reason for that because as you probably know, or at least the vast majority of you know, this international workshop was originally scheduled to be held in April, 2020. So that means that this workshop was one of the first academic gatherings that was canceled due to the coronavirus pandemic. This workshop was postponed time and again. And the fact that we are gathered here and that we can actually hold this gathering today means among many other things that probably the end of this pandemic nightmare is on site. And hopefully, since we plan to organize a similar gathering in 2022, hopefully this next meeting is going to be an in-person activity. And congrats to Ana Ballesteros for having managed to organize all this, but also and especially for having brought her ambitious research action thus far over the last two years. And I want to mention something that I'm sure Anna is not going to mention. That is, perhaps some of you are not familiar with the European academic environment. Some of you, sure, you are, some of you are familiar with this academic environment, but I'm sure that some of you are not particularly familiar with the European academic environment. If that is the case, probably you don't know that when you read the first page of the program and at the bottom of this program, you can read this academic activity is sponsored by the Marie Curie Global Fellowship, whatever, Govern Migration. Okay, a Marie Curie Fellowship is definitely one of the top grants any scholar may aspire to obtain in Europe. This is serious. You can always say, okay, you in Europe, you got the ERC grants that are on top, right? But we got very, 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 very few ERC grants, especially in this field. So having a Marie Curie Global Fellowship means having obtained one of the best grants you can wish to have in Europe. And that is, that is you know, an additional reason to say congratulations. And the second word is thank you. And thank you, first of all, to anyone who have collaborated to make this gathering viable and doable. And among them, I wanna mention here our dearest colleague, Fernando Fano Avila. And thank you also to all the scholars that have contributed to make these two first years of Ana Ballesteros uh, research action so successful. And I wanna mention there at least, at least a few names coming from the U of T Center for Criminology and Social Legal Studies. 
a number of scholars who have been really pivotal in making Anna Ballesteros' research action so successful. They are a list, Professor Audrey Macklin, Professor Gail Sapper, Professor Mariana Valverde, Professor Paula Maruda, and last, but not at all, list, Professor Kelly Hannah Moffat, who is the co-supervisor of this three-year research action. And congratulations and thanks, and this is my last point, for a very specific reason that is related to the texture and character of this international workshop, which is about to begin. This workshop is encouraging us all to engage in the cross-national conversation. And that is extremely important. Yeah, I dare to say that engaging in a cross-national conversation is particularly important in a field like that of immigration enforcement, and particularly immigration detention, for a number of reasons. First reason, because cross-national explorations are always critical. Let me quote here David Nelkan, a leading a British leading social legal scholar, when he mentions time again that the best way to understand what is happening in your scenario, in this case, in your national criminal justice field, is by understanding what is happening in the criminal justice field of the country next door. To put it bluntly, I have always a hard time understanding what is happening in Spain if I do not manage to understand what is happening in Portugal, for instance, right? So a cross-national conversation is always pivotal. But beyond that, when we are talking about immigration enforcement and immigration detention, this kind of exploration is particularly relevant, at least for two reasons. One of them is because when we are talking about immigration enforcement, we are dealing with a huge gap between law in the books and law in action. And we always got problems with this in Europe. In English speaking countries, you are completely used to understand that there is always a gap between law in the books and law in action. For us, it's much, it's much more difficult. But nonetheless, we are not talking about the regular gap. In this field, we are always dealing with a huge gap. And one of the best ways to understand this is, again, by engaging in a cross-national conversation. And finally, because when we are talking about immigration detention, we're speaking the same language, but we are not speaking of the same things. When we are talking about immigration detention and the title of this international workshop is called Inter uh, Immigration Detention Phenomena, we are always talking about something that is different from one jurisdiction to another. What is happening in Canada has nothing to do with immigration detention, for instance, in Greece. And what is happening in Estonia has anything to do with what is happening, for instance, in Portugal, let alone new players in this field, such as Mexico or Chile, just to mention two obvious examples. So when we are talking about immigration detention, we are always talking about notions that need to be translated from one country to another. In the only way that we get to understand this and to bridge this gap and to solve the questions that are arise from this diversity is by actually engaging in a cross-national conversation. So thank you all for being here. And I forgot to mention, by the way, good afternoon for those of you joining us from Europe and good morning for those of you joining us from the Americas. And I think that there is someone from Australia. I don't know what to say there, probably good night or I'm not sure. Okay, so then leave me the floor to my dearest colleague, Audrey Macklin. Well, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction of Anna, the project and what brought us here together. Um, before I go further, let me say that in addition, of course, to the challenges that Anna has faced in gathering uh, so many scholars and advocates together uh, for transnational conversations, uh, of course, Anna also faced first the challenge of gathering people together during a pandemic, leading to, as Jose said, the first postponement. And then second, on the eve of this event, 
um, the Canadian Association of University Teachers imposed a censure on University of Toronto for breaches of academic freedom in relation to a hire. Now, part of uh, if you want to learn more about the censor, uh, I know that the University of Toronto has posted some information uh, on its website, and there is also a website uh, constructed by faculty in support of the censor called censureuofta.ca. And so I won't spend a lot of time here talking about it. I'm just going to suggest that if you want further information, there are places to go. But one of the conditions of the censor, or one of the consequences of the censor that the CAUT imposed, and let me say the CAUT is an umbrella organization representing almost 70,000 faculty across about 120, I think, colleges and universities. One of the conditions is that outside speakers not accept invitations to speak at University of Toronto while that censor is in force. So, in response to that, Anna and many others put in an awful lot of work to relocate uh, in virtual space uh, this workshop to University of Coruña, who, of course, is a partner in uh, Anna's uh, Marie Curie Fellowship. And so here I want to acknowledge and thank both Anna and all of the people who turned on a dime, who worked really hard and really fast to ensure that we could come together. And I'm really delighted that we are all here together. And so I just want to begin uh, with that uh, acknowledgement and thanks in a kind of time that is complicated and difficult and awkward for so many people for so many reasons. So with that said, um, I also, of course, want to echo uh, Jose's praise for Anna, her work, her excellence, and to really say the benefits of transnational conversation are both professional and personal. Um, it has been an unalloyed pleasure and delight to have had Anna amongst us for over a year, I think, in person, and then unfortunately virtually after that due to the pandemic. But even in the virtual sense, the contributions that Anna has made uh, to our community at Criminology and Social Legal Studies, but also to the academic and intellectual community who work on migration detention is already significant. Uh, and I'll just point out a couple of things. One is, of course, that she organized already a workshop that brought many of us together. Uh, even though many of us were Canadian, we hadn't met in person. Um, we were together in a room engaging in a conversation that was um, rich and illuminating and absolutely um, improved in so many ways by Anna's leadership and by the comparative perspectives that she was able to bring herself and to marshal among other participants. And this is really just exemplifying the virtues that Jose was discussing. Secondly, on a personal level, um, one of the fascinating things about uh, somebody coming from the outside and doing comparative work that involves your country is that of course, you start to see things a little bit differently. I don't know about other areas, but in immigration, there's a certain amount of both external praise of Canada that is discomforting for Canadian scholars. Canada is like held up, I don't know, in immigration, sort of the way Denmark gets held up for social welfare or something, you know, some, and, uh, and of course, people who work within those systems know them quite differently. And it is enormously helpful when people from the outside come in and see what things look like from the inside. And I think we really, really value that. One of the other great benefits I have to say is that to perhaps to some people's um, surprise, there are ways in which people who come, people who are already knowledgeable and sophisticated and articulate and perceptive as and Anna as all of those things and more, come to a country and are able to ask questions and elicit information and gather data that actually can be quite difficult for local academics to get. Part of that I think has to do with coming in from the outside with you know, being able to speak to government officials and being able to present oneself legitimately as having no particular preconceptions, no baggage, if you will, no prior commitments. And somehow conversations take on, I suspect, a slightly different tone than those conversations would have if it was a conversation with a Canadian uh, researcher. And of course, the things that we learn from that 
I think are extraordinarily valuable. And uh, I know I have already learned a lot. So uh, with all that, I think I circle back to uh, Jose's initial uh, two very strong uh, commendations. Congratulations to Anna. We fully, I certainly fully appreciate uh, what an extraordinary um, um, honor and what a sort of, signif sort of um, signifier of excellence the Marie Curie Fellowship is. And Anna is fully, fully deserving of that and has uh, manifested that in all sorts of ways. So congratulations and a thank you to Anna, both personally and professionally for all that she has done in the time she's been at Criminology and Sociolegal Studies and that has brought us all here today together. I'll stop there, thank you. Okay, it's my turn. Uh, thank you very much for your really, well, your kind words. Like, uh, well, I am a bit, I don't know what to say, uh, but uh, thank you very much for these words. And I have a little bit of a presentation today. So, well, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody, like as uh, uh, the other presenters said, uh, good afternoon, good morning. It's like good night for some of you. So it is my pleasure to welcome you to the international workshop expanding the penal landscape, the immigration detention phenomena organized by the CREAM Research Group from the University of Coruña in Spain. My name is Ana Ballesteros and I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Coruña in the research project Govern Migration. First, I would like to very much thank all the presenters, you know, the speakers and moderators for your participation in this event. I also wanted to thank all the attendees who in this period of an increasing offer of webinars, seminars, online conferences have decided to join us today and tomorrow. Although online events have some negative points because we lose the opportunity uh, for like establishing more, that more direct contacts among us to enjoy more informal conversation, conversations, the creation of a more friendly and supportive environment. It is also true that online activities allow us to include in our discussions participants that won't be able to do so if the event would have happened in person due to their location, lack of economic resources, et cetera. So I really hope that the future brings us the opportunity to combine different formats, but that we have come, uh, come back to in-person in events soon. So in their case, uh, we will do our best to create a friendly environment for all of you. And once again, thank you very much for uh, being here today. Second, as they both mentioned as well, I would like to explain uh, a little bit more the, that this event is organized by, uh, within the framework of this Marie Curie action by the European Union with these uh, two partners institutions, the University of Toronto and the University of Coruña. And thanks to this project, I had the great opportunity to spend two years at the Center of Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto. And I wanted to uh, very much thank the Center for Criminology for making me feel fully integrated in the daily life of the Center from the beginning and for the constant support for all of its members. I wanted to thank my supervisor in Canada, Kelly Hannah Moffat, who supported me since I decided to submit the application for the project. Audrey Macklin, as member of my advisory board and director of the Center for Criminology and um, Sociolegal Studies. Uh, in particularly as well to Mariana Valverde, Gail Super, and Paula Mauruto for their support until today. Furthermore, during my time in Toronto and in Canada, more broadly speaking, I had the chance to personally meet some of the participants, moderators, and attendees who are here today. I share with them academic events and activities, but also conversations about my project and far beyond that, some of them have participated in my research project under different roles and capacities, and I am extremely, extremely grateful for that. But also I have enjoyed more personal interactions and became friends uh, with, with them, with some of you. So thanks for that as well. Finally, I am already back in Spain enjoying the last year of this research project at the University of Coruña. The CREAM Research Group of the Faculty of Law has hosted me since I, as in size I came back in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. And I wanted uh, to thank you, the group and the coordinator, Patricia Faraldo, for supporting me since the preparation of the application and during the whole period, and for making me feel part of the group since the very beginning. 
in particular to Jose Angel Brandaris for his supervision and support, not only for the project, but also for my academic career as well. So as also they mentioned a little bit about that, this event is part of a series of, of workshops which began in Toronto in, in, 20, in 2019 and is continue, uh, continuing online today. And we hope to finish uh, next year in person in a third workshop at the University of Coruña. And we hope uh, to have the chance to have some of you there in person to continue these conversations in a, in a more real environment. So the purpose of these workshops was to increase the international discussions on immigration detention and border practices by examining practices and pro processes from different countries and to boost uh, academic contacts and collaborations. So this event, as uh, they mentioned as well, was planned to take part last spring in Toronto, but due to the pandemic, we had to postpone uh, until now. And now it is sponsored by the University of Coruña due to the censor imposed by, by count. And I wanted to thank you, the Cream Research Group and the University of Coruña for hosting this event and to all the people who made it possible, especially to Kate Madleo and Fernando Avila Fano for helping me with the logistics and technology and the practical aspects of the event. So coming to a more practical uh, uh, conversation, so regarding the plan for the next two days, we will have two lectures, one from Alison Mount, who will be take place in five minutes. And the second lecture will happen tomorrow by uh, Yolanda Vázquez, professor of law at the University of Cincinnati College of Law. And thanks uh, for, uh, to both of you for accepting the invitation. And we will also have five panels, uh, two panels today and, two, and three panels tomorrow with three presentations in each panel. Uh, um, and we will have a kind of a social event later on today for those of you who want to stay a bit longer. And uh, as some of the attendees don't have the full program with bios and abstracts, I am gonna, when I uh, finish my speech, I am gonna share in on the chat so you can have like all the information uh, of, the, of the participants and, and, and presenters. So um, as they mentioned as well, the panels will cover different countries and issues. As you can see, uh, you will see in the program, uh, we will have panels more geographically focused, for instance, in Canada or, or, or in Spain, but others analyzing different practices, practices and techniques of immigration detention and containment of human mobility involving different countries. So um, we will have, we, we will try to have like 15 minutes break or 30 minute breaks to allow you to uh, separate from the screen and to refresh your, your minds for a while during the afternoon or morning. And um, well, I am not gonna go into details about uh, the length of the presentations, but um, broadly speaking, uh, the keynote speakers will have like around 40, 45 minutes. And for the uh, panels, we will have 20 minutes uh, with 15 minutes of Q&A. So moderators will remind participant, uh, participants this information at the beginning of the panels, but well, just to say you, uh, say you a bit of a, uh, questions of organizations. And uh, well, in order to uh, organize the discussions, uh, those who want to make a comment or question, please use the chat so we can keep an order or uh, you can choose to uh, write your question or to uh, say it uh, aloud. So feel free to, to choose what you prefer. And uh, well, uh, also as um, Jose Angel Brandarit said, uh, we are gonna uh, record the sessions. So the lectures and the presentations, but initially not the discussions, because although it is great to have access to the presentations later on, we also think that sometimes the Q&A is a more spontaneous space for developing ideas or reflections and also make questions. So it is sometimes good to uh, don't feel that you are all the time being recorded. So feel free like to share uh, your thoughts uh, in a more like not constrained space. And we are gonna, uh, we are planning to upload the recordings later on. So uh, we will keep you posted about the link, etc. And that's it for now. With no more delays, uh, we will start with the first lecture and I will pass the word to Audrey Macklin, who will be the moderator. Thank you very much again and hope you enjoy the workshop. Thank you, Anna. Hi again, everybody. 
I have the great pleasure of introducing today's uh, keynote speaker, uh, Professor Allison Mounts, who is a professor of geography and a Canada Research Chair in Global Migration at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, she also directs Laurier's International Migration Research Center and edits the journal Politics and Space. You can read more about Allison's many, many accomplishments uh, in the participant bios, but I will just highlight here that among her many uh, wonderful and uh, influential publications is the very recent, uh, The Death of Asylum, Hidden Geographies of the Enforcement Archipelago, for which the Association, American Association of Geographers awarded um, the, I'm sorry, the, right. I don't know if it's the American Association of Geographers. Anyway, for which uh, Allison won the 2020 Globe Award for Public Understanding of Geography. And uh, Allison will speak for about 40 minutes, then we'll have a half an hour for questions. And as Anna said, either just indicate in the chat that you'd like to ask a question or write the question itself in the chat and we'll make sure that it, it gets to Allison. And without further ado, uh, Allison, um, looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. I want to thank you all for having me here. It's a real honor to get to speak to everyone this morning. And I appreciate all of the incredible work that has gone into scheduling, organizing, rescheduling, and reorganizing um, this conference. So I join you in, in saying congratulations on today and all the great conversations and presentations to come. I'm really looking forward to them. I also want to say that, that as a member of Wilfrid Laurier's, um, Wilfrid Laurier University's Faculty Association, which is called WALUPA, we have so many great acronyms, um, and a member of the CAUT, I support the decision to censure the U of T for the breach of academic freedom related to Dr. Azarova's employment, and also note her important work on Palestine and on international legal rights. And I appreciate the time and care that Anna and Audrey and others have taken to enter into conversation and the adjustments of plans around the, around the censure. Um, I also want to recognize, as we meet today, the, the continued and escalating violence happening right now between Israel and Palestine as we meet, and of course, its direct connection to, to much of the work that, that we do, to the topics that we're here to discuss, spatial confinement, human rights violations. I also want to acknowledge that I live and work on land that belongs to the Wendat, Chippewa, Anishinaabe, neutral and credit indigenous nations. And it's really important to remember past histories of displacement and dispossession that are premised on some of the same racialized logics of containment um, that are again, topics of our, of our conversations today. So in order to proceed, I like to use lots of visuals when I talk about research. So if it's okay with the organizers, technical organizers out there, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so someone maybe could give me a thumbs up when they see that on the screen. Do you see my slide? Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. Great. So Anna very kindly talked to me about um, sharing with you some of the arguments from uh, my, my recent book that Audrey mentioned, The Death of Asylum. And I'm going to do that, um, but I also want to carry the conversation a little bit further uh, to talk about um, more some more recent thinking I've been doing about asylums after lives. And um, in order to do that, I'm going to offer up a provocation for today. And I and I really appreciated Jose's remarks that we have to remember that detention systems look very different, of course, in national settings. And I think this is what makes an international or transnational conversation so interesting. And some of you will have different perspectives on this provocation that I'm gonna offer you. So I, wanna, I want to um, think about detention itself as an afterlife of asylum. And I'm gonna cover a bunch of ground to build my way um, through this argument to explain what I mean. Um, and I'll begin with land borders because land borders so often are the ones that call our immediate attention, you know, drawing on Nick DiGenova's work on the spectacle, the spectacular politics of crossing, of asylum, 
Um, and here I quote Gloria Ansaldúa in saying, borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. And I begin with Ansel Dua's seminal writing in her text, Borderlands La Frontera, because I think she um, really foresaw so many of the kinds of things that have happened over time with borders and in the borderlands and people who live there, um, where borders are constantly um, being transformed and also geographically um, extended transnationally <clears throat> deeper and deeper into the the routes, the transnational journeys that people are taking to try to reach places. Um, Ansal Dua was a Chicana woman writing uh, with a decolonial project of looking at the histories of borders and how um, we need to examine not only their present state, um, but their past and how they came to be where they are. And I think um, there are important through lines to connect Ansal Dua's work to some contemporary writers on abolition where I'll end my talk. But although it's often land borders that capture our attention and can dominate some of our conversations, particularly in the North American context about migration um, more broadly, it's also important that we examine a very similar politics of crossing and issues surrounding asylum at sea, um, where so much is happening, but is often more difficult for general publics to witness um, because these sites are less accessible. They can be more easily hidden from view, less monitored by the international media um, or by, by everyday people who can't necessarily get to remote locations uh, of enforcement. And it's crossings at sea and asylum seeking by boat um, that was central to the island detention project, which is, a, which is a project that I ran for several years and which is the subject of, of my book, The Death of Asylum. The map you see here is not a um, comprehensive map. It doesn't show all of the islands where asylum seekers are or have been detained, but shows some of the field sites of the project, um, which looked at these heavily politicized crossings um, between, <clears throat> between regions. So um, looking, for example, at the history of detention on Guantanamo Bay, um, looking at struggles to enter Europe through Lampedusa, and at many of the ways that Australia is utilizing other countries' territories to carry out um, detention and offshore excise and export its asylum or responsibilities towards asylum seekers. In these borderlands, we three the, see the convergence of three trends that are much broader in global migration, not exclusive to the borderlands, a general rise in asylum seeking, which of course mirrors the broader numbers of the recent historic high in displacement, um, the global growth of detention, and this um, continuing project of border externalization as we see the transnational extension of deterrence regimes. And this is a map that many of you will be familiar with as detention scholars. Um, it's from the Global Detention Project. It's their global map that I think just shows the, the volume, the vastness of this system that has developed in a relatively uh, short period of time. And here I want to call attention particularly to those borderland sites of crossing where detention has been built up, has been built up, for example, across Central America and Mexico for people en route to North America to make claims for asylum, across countries in North Northern Europe or Southern, sorry, Northern Africa and Southern Europe. Again, uh, this region of movement and crossing and stasis where people are increasingly writing about all different kinds of stasis like hotspots. Um, and of course the region surrounding uh, the, the, the Indian and Pacific oceans in Australia. Um, in my book with Jenna Lloyd, Boats, Borders and Bases, we try to trace some of the roots of these contemporary practices of externalization. And this is where I wanna to start to develop this argument uh, for you about the relationship between 
externalization and asylum seeking and detention. And so often in the United States context, especially um, the public discourse on immigration and our geographical imagination of uh, detention is so tied to the US southern border with Mexico. Um, but when Jenna and I did archival research to trace back the roots, the histories of the geography, how did these, this vast detention system, the largest in the world, come into being? What did that look like geographically? We found really important ties to the history of U.S. interception in the Caribbean of Haitian and Cuban nationals on their way to the United States to seek asylum, going back to the 1970s, um, to the early 1980s, infamous Mario boat lift when 125,000 Cubans arrived and continuing on into the 1990s. So what we saw was an important pattern uh, where spikes in flows of people seeking asylum um, engendered heavily enforcement oriented crisis narrated responses um, that involved the buildup of both enforcement at sea and detention on domestic territory and on non-domestic or international territory. We saw the movement of programs to exclude and expedite the process of asylum, the processing of asylum claims. So for example, the 1978 Haitian program designed to counter what was called the Haitian threat by its architect. Um, in which Haitians were racialized, were treated differently. Um, much of the logic premised on the assumption that they were economic migrants. Um, all kinds of empirics show that they were sub great, um, more likely to be subjected to detention, more likely to be held for longer periods of time, and that this program was all about setting up expedited access. So for example, representing people en masse um, in order to deport them. So uh, this was challenged and scholars have written about this like Naomi Paik um, uh, about this program. Uh, it was challenged and overturned in court two years later in 1980. Very few people actually got asylum through this. Um, and the, in the decision, it was written that never before had there been an ex expedited program designed to expel applicants for asylum. And it was highly significant that this was a, a mass arrival of black people. And so we found really in the roots of so much of the buildup of detention in the United States, anti-Black racism at its roots. And this is important because these responses, here's another spike that came in the 1990s. Um, this is data from the Coast Guard on the interdiction of Haitians. The responses to these arrivals resulted in a landscape that lasted. So what happened with, at the time was that at first people were all held in detention in the Chrome Detention Center in Miami, and then eventually they were fawned out across facilities across the US. And in our book, we sort of trace the details of these site wars and the decisions, which had lasting effects. Some of these facilities um, still exist today. And yet in the official narratives at the time, um, this is from a US border report, you can see um, that the spectacle of, and, and the narration of threat is so tied generally to the land borders and tends to obscure what's happening farther off sea, in this case, in the Caribbean, where the United States was also developing a transnational archipelago of enforcement using military bases um, to detain people. So this was really the period of this, the development of this philosophy of this practice of prevention through deterrence. And it's this prevention through deterrence that has lasted through so much of what we have seen develop in the decades since. Of course, one of the most notorious sites associated with this is Guantanamo Bay. So building on the maritime buffer zone strategy across the Caribbean, and then the euphemistically called safe haven program, which was the name of the development of these camps in the Caribbean, um, Guantanamo Bay was, was probably the most significant and lasting site where asylum seekers uh, were detained. <clears throat> so what we find in the book is that this period of time really planted important seeds for so much of what was to follow and what we see happening today. The development of transnational deterrence regimes, the polit politicization and criminalization of people seeking asylum, particularly by boat, a direct link between asylum seeking and the growth of detention, 
and a policy model that was ready for export. And other scholars have studied how this policy model has been exported, for example, from the United States um, to Australia and other places. And what I wanna argue, jumping to an aside for a moment and building on the importance of thinking about different national contexts is that this history of strong enforcement responses to boats, even boats in very small numbers, which is the case in Canada, we find that kind of ad hoc measures, policy experiments taken in the borderlands at the time, make their way into um, policy and legislation in lasting ways. So often resulting in more restrictive measures that apply writ large to all refugee claimants. Um, so we have this historical period in the time since across the 1990s and the 2000s where um, there have been more and more border deaths, deaths at sea, at the same time that um, countries have been investing more greatly in enforcement at sea and also detention. So the development of harmful policies, I think social scientists now have consensus, whether they do quantitative or qualitative research, that greater uh, border enforcement, although sometimes narrated as humanitarian, in fact, renders people more precarious as they take greater risks. And so we see this strong correlation um, between greater enforcement and greater numbers of deaths at sea, or to summarize, um, quoting criminologist Sharon Pickering in the conversation, there's no evidence that asylum seeker deterrence policy works. And yet, this is the kind of trajectory that we're living with. So the phrase irregular migration emerged in the European Union for the first time in the 1970s. Um, and it has contributed, although an ambiguous term, um, it, it has fueled the massive investment over time in, in the security industry, in surveillance, control, and detention. So we can trace all these different ways that the history of externalization, the policies and languages that have developed to name these phenomena and movements um, have really tied detention to asylum seeking and migration by boat, all driven by a logic of deterrence. And so in response to a search for protection, we end up with these vast systems that in fact fail to protect human life and instead treat people often as less than human. So many scholars are writing about this today, about the idea that racialized, these are racialized policy, policies designed to produce precarity and death. So I'm thinking of work, for example, by Maurice Steele, Steel, Camilla Hawthorne, Chetta Mainwaring, um, Martina Tazioli in her book last year called Making Migration, writes a lot about how this involves the use of colonial technologies of dispersal, of choke points, division, grouping and scattering, stranding and draining. When we look at the policies and the geographies of um, what is happening for people on the move, trying to reach territory um, to make a claim for asylum or in search of livelihood and survival. So in my own work over time, I used to write more about shrinking paths to asylum or the erosion of access to asylum. But in conversation um, with so many scholars, for example, writing about death, uh, social death, like um, Lisa Cacho, um, Judith Butler's work, uh, I really came to understand that um, we were seeing something much larger, which was the death of asylum itself, asylum itself in crisis. And in conversation with Judith, right, Judith Butler's writing about um, the idea that obituaries allow for the public distribution of grief, I opened the book um, with a, a short obituary discussing um, the death of asylum. And what you see pictured here is actually a memorial, a small memorial built on Christmas Island um, to remember the death of people who were traveling by boat and sank, a boat that sank um, in 2001 between the Indonesian island of Sumatra and Christmas Island. And this is the Civ X incident, some of you may know about, which is memorialized across Australia. So while many um, activists and researchers are documenting physical deaths, um, which is one component of the death of asylum, 
We also need to talk about its ontological death. Uh, the fact that all of these geographical uh, moves offshore are making it more and more difficult to actually inhabit the category of asylum seeker, um, as well as the political death. In, in other words, by the virtue of hiding, obscuring what is happening, um, not enough people in fact are able to know about these practices and viol this violence that's happening in mundane ways offshore um, every day. Uh, and so the book is structured around these three um, aspects these three dimensions of the death of asylum. And the first chapter offers a genealogy of externalization. It's a genealogy that's driven by these crisis moments. Um, and it really picks up where Jenna and I left off um, with that history in the Caribbean and then moves forward to look at these like kind of lurches from crisis to crisis in different national settings. And what I argue is that we can find within these crises kind of a Gordian knot that has a particular set of components um, present. Uh, so it's difficult to reduce them to any one aspect, but that this combination of things seems to repeat itself as a pattern across these uh, crises, crises, whereby um, by, by governments respond to certain migrations, um, uh, with these enforcement measures that at first seem um, to be ad hoc, narrated as policy on the fly or policy on the run, that eventually, uh, again, make their way into something more lasting. And so when we go back and look at this genealogy, that we can then build out a more traditional history that sees across each decade how um, these, the logic of prevention through deterrence has taken hold through greater and greater investments in enforcement measures, both in terms of externalization and the buildup of detention until we arrive um, at, the, at the 2010s at our most recent de decade with a kind of freneticism um, when we think of like the rapid opening and closure in, facil in facilities, the transfer of people, um, the bilateral arrangements between countries to keep people uh, farther and farther away. So an incredible investment and also just freneticism in terms of the response. Within this morass in the borderlands, um, I am interested especially in the role of islands where, and I argue in the book that islands are central to understanding global migration, that they're one place where these ad hoc crisis driven policy experiments um, can be seen uh, on their way to becoming more formalized. Um, so if we look to islands, they portend what is happening with migration governance elsewhere. And in each of these different regions, we can trace out these spatial patterns, the geographical spread of border enforcement across a region, the conversion of islands from, uh, from spaces of passage or safe haven to eventually carceral spaces as infrastructure gets built up there, as capacity to detain grows, and as borders and spaces of isolation proliferate all premised on racism, on fear, dehumanization, and different kinds of distancing. Um, the Australian case I, I often return to because it's such, a, it's such a pronounced one and it's such an important one that is now becoming the model that others are importing as we move and kind of track these policies from place to place. So many of you will know about the 2001 MV Tampa incident as the key crisis that then gave rise under John Howard's leadership to what was called the Pacific Solution and the use of islands, both other countries, so Papua New Guinea's Manus Island and Nauru, and also uh, Christmas Island, which is Australian overseas territory. So creating tiers of access, using the power of excision to cut people and their access to rights out. Um, so that we end up with regional landscapes of detention that spread and look like this. And that individuals on the move must then um, navigate so that you have individual journey maps that look like this. And increasingly, there's so much literature on transnational journeys that are cir circuitous, that take years, that involve crossing multiple borders, spending periods, multiple periods of time in detention in different national settings, 
um, that involve deportation as well as forward movement so that um, we, we, if we ever thought of the crossing of the border as the crossing the line, we can now think of the spatial form of the border as itself the spatial form of the island as one of containment um, where people experience periods and all kinds of limbo, limbo that's um, psychological, that is spatial, that is legal and so on. This is a photograph of Christmas Island, uh, the Northwest Point High Security Facility, which is just one of three facilities built on Christmas Island. So one of the findings of the project is that carceral spaces multiply within the islands. We see the buildup of multiple detention centers and then the, the kind of proliferation of separating people, isolating people within those facilities, whether it's separating out families, whether it's separating men from women, different groups from different national origins, or the creation of more and more um, solitary confinement cells. Of course, so much research shows how harmful and violent um, these practices are. All of you will know this, that they are incredibly detrimental to people's physical and mental health, that they cause distress and re-traumatization, and that these experiences correlate with greater remoteness and longer time in detention. So, um, so for people who are held in detention on islands, it's very common for them to talk about struggles with physical and mental health. Suicide attempts are also common, all of which calls to mind Judith Butler's writing when she says, whose life counts as human, whose lives count as lives, and finally, what makes for a grievable life? So I wanna return here to Gloria Ansaldúa writing, Caminante no hay puentes, no hace puentes al andar. Voyager, there are no bridges, one builds bridges as one walks. The question being, who is fighting the death of asylum? How do we walk our way out of these vast systems of detention that we've walked into? And in the book, the penultimate chapter, um, chapter six is actually about the many campaigns to fight detention. Um, because of course, people are not islands, they cannot be isolated. Um, and so many of these campaigns are premised on locating and mapping and connecting and building exactly the kinds of bridges um, that I think Ansaldu and others are writing about. And so, so many campaigns have to do with this kind of um, what Cindy Katz calls count, feminist counter topographies. So if the kind of topological border is constantly on the move to isolate people, um, a campaign to fight that has to do with locating them and connecting them, building cross-border networks. Um, and that's why I think we see so many efforts to map, to count deaths, to remember and memorialize, to build cross-border solidarities, to build visitor campaigns locally and, um, and more broadly. Uh, to, to draw templates for visitor campaigns and, of course, um, protests that emerge both within and beyond uh, the facilities and are premised on connecting people on the inside and the outside. So this is all fighting the politics of invisibility and isolation with the politics of location. The idea being that to memorialize is to not forget or look away from what's happening. Social media is crucial to these campaigns so that people are not disappeared. And the social movements, um, I think importantly draw, there are social movements that draw on island detention histories and wonderful arts that are coming out of emerging from the borderlands, from detention facilities, from cross-border collaborations. And I'll show what I see to be just a few examples. One is Lampedusa's Boat Cemetery, which has been heavily photographed, will be very familiar to those of you working in the EU context, um, and has been the site of struggle over the politics of erasure and a place where activists on the island were sneaking in to recover personal effects from the boats in order to memorialize histories of migration that were crossing the islands, but that were sometimes the island, but were sometimes hidden from view in official records on um, arrivals. And so they became the basis of a local um, immigration, small immigration museum. Another example that I find so um, powerful is, many of you will be familiar with the writing of the wonderful Behrouz Bouchani, 
Um, he's pictured here in the film that he made collaboratively with Arash Sarvastani that came out in 2017 called Choka, Please Tell Us the Time. And in order to make this film and indeed to, to write his award-winning memoir, um, No Friend But the Mountains, um, Beiruz Bushani worked with mobile phones and specifically WhatsApp technology to send thousands, tens of thousands of texts that contained, in the case of his memoir, textual messages or voice messages, and in the case of the film, uh, video clips that Arash then uh, spent years compiling and editing as the two worked together um, to produce this film, which documents what, what was happening um, during the several years that Beirut spent detained on Manus Island um, and where there was a separate isolation unit created called Choka. That's what Choka is a reference to. So again, an island within an island, um, this, this separate unit was used to isolate and punish people within the, the larger detention facility. Um, and so again, I think this is an example of, of using, using arts, um, arts emerging from detention from the borderlands to convey uh, human rights violations and conditions and experiences that are um, otherwise uh, hidden from view of general publics. And if you haven't seen this film, I highly, or read the book, I highly recommend them. So in spite of, all of the ways that I think <clears throat> these practices have been proven to be harmful over and over again and criticized for human rights violations, we nonetheless can trace their movement globally. And I've started to do that for you today from the US into the Caribbean, the US operating in the Pacific, exporting its model to Australia. And we can continue, as I mentioned, to follow this movement to other parts of the world. So. Um, we have uh, uh, Denmark deciding to renovate a small facility on a small island about 80 kilometers from Copenhagen for the detention of asylum seekers uh, inspired by Manus Island and Nauru detention facilities. We have the recent revelation from the Home Office from Priti Patel talking about detaining asylum seekers on potentially on Ascension Island and St. Helena. So again, drawing on colonial histories and exploiting faraway uh, lands to carry out these enforcement projects. And then um, Bangladesh, which has been building up a silt island, many of you might have heard of by now, Bazan Char, um, where uh, in December of last year, several hundred uh, Rohingya refugees were moved by boat from Cox's Bazaar to Bazanchar. And it, it's premised on much of the logic of island detention elsewhere, the idea being that once you're located on the island, you can't leave unless you agree to go home. This has been heavily criticized because, for many reasons, um, one of which is that Bazanchar is located um, in the path of cyclones during the storm season, so it's a very precarious place to put people. Um, it's been stated that the capacity is to hold up to 100,000 um, Rohingya refugees there. The term char actually means part land and part water. It's a particular form, geographical form, that disappears and reemerges. And it's a term that actually comes from British colonial rule in India, uh, which involved extraction of natural resources, which resulted in the buildup of ri river embankments, um, which eventually became permanent. And this I want to acknowledge, I learned from a wonderful student in my seminar this semester named Nirene Khan, who is researching Bazan Char. And I think that char is an apt metaphor for the infrastructure surrounding the death of asylum, that the, the ways that these kind of ad hoc temporary crisis responses become permanent through practices like externalization and detention. And so turning to the last part of my talk, I'm really interested in thinking about the afterlives of asylum, about what is lost and what remains in the haunting. And in, in using the term haunting, I'm engaging with sociologists like um, Avery Gordon, who write about ways that violence that is seemingly in the past but not dealt with remains alive in the present. And so here I wanna just lay out what it is that I'm thinking about 
in the afterlife of asylum. And of course, I think it's important to ask first, uh, what should we be grieving with the death of asylum? Have we reached the inevitable conclusion of a project that was perhaps always destined to fail um, since it always ac accorded the power of inclusion and exclusion and decisions around belonging to a system of, of nation states? What And also, what are we left with and what might we search for in the wake of political asylum? What is the afterlife of protection when asylum is no longer accessible? How is refugee protection being reconfigured in relation to transnational enforcement and some of these histories that I've talked about? And what is life in the wake of displacement, detention, and island detention for the people involved? So what does this look like? I'll give you some actual examples. I think we can think about detention itself as an afterlife of asylum, a island detention being a perfect example. These were never set up as robust responses to uh, the protection of those who were seeking it. Um, these are sites that were built on colonial histories uh, that exploited asymmetrical relations of dependency, um, whereby uh, for a time, island communities and island economies were taken over by the detention industry. So one of the things that interests me is now, for example, in the Australian context, when some of them are being shut down, what happens um, in, the, in the aftermath? So both for the people who were held in detention, who are then released and moved on somewhere to their next phase, whether it's back home or a third country, and what happens to the islanders and island communities who were also involved in island detention? And this is the subject of a new research program um, that I've just had funded from SHIRK here in Canada that I'm going to be doing. I'm gonna be doing oral histories with people who were formerly detained on islands and also working in island detention facilities about life after this closure, after the departure. And I think of these as a kind of intimate geopolitics. So many of you might know about the, the, the trade that happened between Australia and the United States, this geopolitical deal that they struck, wherein the United States offered under President Barack Obama in his final months in office um, to resettle up to 1,200 people from Manus and Nauru in exchange for a much smaller number of Central American asylees uh, from the United States being sent to Australia. This is not the first time that um, such a deal has been struck between the two countries. In the past, for example, the US has sent uh, plane loads of Haitian asylees to Australia. So um, I'm gonna be doing oral histories with people to understand how they make sense of these transnational journeys. So for example, what does it mean if you had the US involved geopolitically in your country, you were displaced, you made your way trying to get to Australia to make a claim for asylum, but ended up in another country detained on an island only to eventually years later be traded to the United States for refugee resettlement. So these are, I think, an important afterlife of asylum, the geopolitical deal, which is really building on years of kind of bilateral arrangements between countries to either move people in one direction or another to hold them in place. Um, so there's an increasing literature on these deals um, building on this history. Uh, and I think, you know, the EU-Turkey deal is a good example of one of the empirically largest such geopolitical deals. Austin Kocher has been writing about the euphemistically called migrant protection program, wherein the U.S., you know, held asylum seekers in Mexico. So in all of these regions I've been talking about, we can see these kinds of arrangements. Mexico, sorry, the United States making deals with Mexico and countries of Central America to inhibit people's passage who are trying to get to North America. Um, think of Italy and Libya, um, Australia and all of its bilateral arrangements. So these are all still premised on the logic of deterrence. They're designed to strip people of human agency, restricting their access to mobility. 
they're premised still on revealing and obscuring certain relationships, right? Temporal relationships whereby we somehow forget the US's role in the original conflict and displacement and focus on its present of resettling um, or spatial you know, um, hiding, revealing and, and, and hiding. Um, so again, there are all kinds of ways in which these, um, these arrangements, policies, narratives present one piece of the story and often hide another. And they're another form of policy experimentation, and one that I think very cynically, you know, uses people as geopolitical pawns. So in this particular deal, um, which when President Trump came into office, he just called it the, a dumb deal. Um, and he notoriously, you know, had this um, phone call with the Australian Prime Minister, who he then hung up on, and The Guardian published the transcript. In spite of all this noise, and in spite of the fact that the Trump administration largely shut down refugee resettlement, um, the deal was quietly honored, and people were moved quietly. And I say quietly because I think most Americans, for example, don't necessarily know much about this. Um, were quietly resettled. So the figure on the left shows um, somewhat dated information because it was published in June 2020, showing um, what was happening to people on Nauru and Manus Islands. At that point, there had been 619 people resettled. The most recent figure I saw was that that number is now up over 900 people resettled in the US. Currently, there are 239 people still on Manus and Nauru. And it was just recently announced that Australia's new budget for offshore immigration processing for the next year is 812 million. And it's also been um, released that over the last five years, Australia has paid 1.4 billion Australian dollars to Canstruct, which is a Brisbane based company um, that's been running those facilities most recently. So this leaves us with a lot to think about in the relationships between these things. And there's one more connection that I wanna draw out before I close, which is to Canada where I'm located right now um, and Canada's private sponsorship program, which Audrey Macklin and other scholars have written about. And interestingly, there's a group of Australian immigrants in Canada who have been organizing to use Canada's private sponsorship program, which is a, a, again, a policy that's gotten a lot of attention whereby members of civil society can form groups and mobilize resources to kind of partner with the Canadian government to sponsor refugees privately. And there's a group called Ads Up <clears throat> of Australians who've been organizing to sponsor people, refugees from the islands. Their project's been slowed because of the pandemic. Um, this, it's not to say that these two programs bear any resemblance to each other on each side of the Canada-US border, but just that it's again fascinating what to me what is happening um, in terms of the reconfiguration of protection and what kind of models like new policy models are being utilized and explored um, to resolve issues of displacement. So we see again, direct ties between asylum seeking by boat, the uses of detention, um, but also refugee resettlement and these kind of deals and hybrid forms of policy experimentation, all of which begin to look like reconfigurations of protection in interesting ways. So just to conclude as my time is up, um, and to, to talk about really what are questions for me moving forward that I'm really looking forward to talking about as I listen to all of your work during the next couple of days. I'm very excited by the calls for abolition that are coming from various corners. Uh, scholars like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who's arguing that carceral geographies must be fought with abolition. I'm thinking of important work by Maria Giannakopoulos and Claire Lofnan, who are writing about abolition as a decolonizing strategy. And I'm very inspired by Beirut Bushani and Omid Tofigian's Manus prison theory. I'm, I'm inspired by it because once again, it emerges from the borderlands, from detention as an intellectual, philosophical, creative, political project, as they call it 
a call that builds on other calls for cross-border solidarities to really connect contemporary forms of border violence to interlocking systems of oppression and colonial imaginaries, um, that these connections are the way forward, the only way to dismantle and challenge, abolish and abolish uh, the detention industry. And this is a quote from um, Omid's writing about Manas prison theory in a, in a paper published last year and about his own connection and positionality to Beirut's project. So he was one of Beirut's translators of, of the prolific body of work that Beirut wrote while in detention on Manas Island. Um, and to Omid himself has a, uh, history of his family was is Iranian, was displaced and in exile, moved between the United States um, and Australia. And he writes, significant aspects of our identities and histories represent fragmentation, disruption, disjointedness, and scattered thoughts and forces. These characteristic factors enhance the power and originality of the text in many ways. They include the subject positions of the author and translator, the political and policymaking environment, rhetoric and ideologies, the mode of production, and the structure, content, and symbolism and tropes in Bushani's work. And I end there because I think there's um, so much for us to learn from and build on and join in these solidarities um, and in looking for new ways forward and new networks and connections and collaborations um, as we work together to research and map and also try to dismantle some of what um, has, has become so quickly a vast global system of detention. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful, provocative, uh, and very moving presentation. So, Allison, it, um, there's much, I, I have many questions I have and so much I want to learn more about, but now is the time for others to pose questions and um, I'm going to open up the chat and people are free to um, indicate that they have a question or if they prefer, they can um, actually just uh, put the question directly into the chat. Now I'm trying to open that up, but I am not able to do so. So just give me one moment, everybody. I do apologize. I seem unable to get into my chat and see questions that have come up. So. Um, I can see the chat, Audrey. Right. Oh, wait, um, yeah, because I can't. Um, so yeah, you're just gonna have to moderate your 